here we're sitting on the edge of one of the many intertidal rock pools along the KwaZulu-Natal coast. Now, these rock pools are a great place to go and explore for marine life because it's sheltered from the waves and it's a nice little environment where you get many different species. And today we're going to try and see if we can find some sea hares. Sea hares are mollusks which have largely lost the shell. So actually uh, there are a couple of dead shells that I've picked up here. So the shells are very, very fragile, delicate, and don't cover the animal at all. In, in fact, you can't see the shell from the outside. The, the shell is covered by the body of the animal. So it looks like a naked slug. They're quite similar to the nudibranchs, right? Yes, the nudibranchs have lost the shell completely. And uh, in the sea hares, there's a vestigial shell that's, that's still present, but not really any use for protection. It's just an evolutionary vestige. Cool. And most of them are grazers? So almost all of the sea hares are herbivorous. They're, they're, they're the cattle of the rock pool here, and they wander around and graze on the seaweeds. A couple of specialized forms have become predatory and feed on other sea hares. Um, you were saying something when we were chatting earlier about them being hermaphrodites there. Oh yes, one of the really interesting things about all sea hares and nudibranchs is that they're hermaphrodite. In other words, each individual has both male and female sex organs. And that's really very handy if you're looking for a girlfriend or a boyfriend because any individual that you find is a potential partner. Anyone will do. Anyone will do, yeah, that's right. And then they lay a very conspicuous egg mass which looks like a bowl of a bunch of yellow spaghetti and often that's the first thing that you see. The sea hares are, are quite cryptic but the eggs are very obvious. So when you see a bunch of eggs, if you look around that area you'll very often find the, the, the sea hare that laid it. The reason why these animals are called sea hares is that they have two tentacle-like organs on the head that uh, somewhat resemble the ears of a hare. So, uh, but they're, they're chemosensory, they're smell organs, not hearing organs. They stick out on the top of the head and that's how they get the common name, sea hares. And they're using those to like smell the water and find yeah, out where things yeah. are. So they can track one another, or like if they've got another mate that they want to follow, then uh, they, they can follow one another. Just going. <laughs> yeah, smelling the water and tracking their way along. Sorry to interrupt, but we did a little bit of research after filming and discovered that the sea hares actually only live for a year, so they have an annual life cycle. Um, we got that footage of them mating and the eggs down in the Western Cape, so they also occur down here and in fact across the globe. Uh, you'll also notice that we got some footage of a brown sea hare and a green sea hare, and apparently they change color according to the seaweed which they're eating. And I just thought that was really interesting and thought we should drop it in, so carry on Charles. This is an interesting one, Matt, because most sea hares are herbivorous and eat seaweeds, but occasionally you get sea hares which have become predatory and kind of feed on their own kind. So this one here, this blue one, is a predatory um, sea hare. It's also like a shellless mollusk, but it follows the odor trail of other sea hares. So when a sea hare's been walking along, it leaves a mucus trail and then the predatory sea hare follows that mucus trail. It's sensing it in the water with its little rhinophores that stick up on the top of its head. And then it tracks it down and attacks it from behind and, and eats it. Aren't they called assassin? They're assassin. Assassin, yeah. assassin sea hares, yeah. yes. So how do they do that? We keep talking about smelling. How do they do that? The rhinophores are chemoreceptors. So the odor is dissolved in the water and then they're just picking up those odor molecules in the water and then tracking up the, the concentration gradient. Most of these animals operate by smell much more than they operate by sight. They're more like dogs than, than humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, Matt, come over here. There's a really good one here. Look at this. Wow. This is a bubble shell. It's 
so what we've got here is a, an ad advanced group of snails that's showing a progressive reduction of the shell. So in the bubble shells, then they're still quite a clearly distinct and often very pretty, but thin and delicate shell. So you see this animal can't possibly retract into his shell. So the shell is just protecting his, uh, his guts and his whole foot is, is, is outside. It's actually very brightly colored as a, as a warning. So many of these brightly colored animals like sea slugs are actually telling predators that, look at me, I'm brightly colored, that means I'm not good to eat. So they're toxic to, to feed on. All the bubble shells from the two or three different species on the KwaZulu-Natal coast are predators of polychaete worms. So they move around on the sand surface sniffing for worms and then when they find a worm they'll dig it out and, and consume it. In the, in the bubble shells the shell is still visible and uh, quite, quite pretty actually. And then the next stage in the progression are the sea hairs. So in the sea hairs there's still a shell present but you can't see it from the outside. It's just a very delicate thin internal structure and the animal appears to be just naked like a slug. Mm -hmm.